Hey, Lena. Hey. How's it going? Good. How are you doing? I'm super excited by that talk you just saw. Me too. I was like, oh, I forgot about that other thing. Oh, and the other thing we've been working on. <laughs> it's amazing. All right. Good. But I'm going to let you take it from here. Unless you're still setting up, I'm happy to chat to the folks um, in our audience. Great. Um, do you think we should start? Should we give it a few minutes or? Let's. Oh, we're, wow, we're right on time. Way to go, Amjad. Very timely. Um, let's go ahead and start. We've got 55 people in our audience. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Otherwise, Govin, this is your stage. Go ahead. Yeah, where's everybody from? I'm in Oakland, California, UK, Australia. Wow. Thanks for staying up. Fremont. Oh, you should have come over. All right, let me share my screen and then let's get started. All right. So as you might have seen from the keynote, uh, this is a talk about how we're approaching AI more broadly at Replit. Uh, my name is Govin. Um, I'm an AI and machine learning engineer here. Uh, thank you so much for spending some of your Saturday with me, you know, wherever you are in the world. And I want to talk to you about what we're currently imagining for AI at Replit. So as you've heard and you probably know, at Replit, our mission is to bring the next billion software creators online. And as these next billion software creators come online, I wonder, what are they going to create with their powers? And how are we at Replit going to serve them in creating? And so, you know, in short, what's a vision that's worthy of the next billion software creators? And what could AI have to do with it? Um, now, at Replit, we try to study the history of our field. And when we want to have a vision for the future, we try to learn from the best visions of the past. And to me, one of the most inspiring visions of the past is the one embodied by something called the Dynabook. So in the chat, in the poll, who's heard of the Dynabook? Okay, great. We've got four people who have heard of it, 17 people who haven't yet. My hope, Bardiad is super excited to see that we're going to talk about the Dynabook. My hope is by the end of the talk, we're going to be at 100%. And one of my hopes is also that I can convey some of my inspiration to you and that you might be inspired to learn more about it too. So in the next 45 minutes, we're going to talk about what the Dynabook is. We're going to talk about the vision that was behind it. We're going to talk about this vision and how we're beginning to reimagine it on Replit. And finally, we're going to have a demo and then we're going to have time for Q&A. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so this is a sketch of the Dynabook from 1972. And it was sketched by this person here, who's named Alan Kay. And you can see him standing with a mock of the Dyna book in nearly 40 years later in 2008. Now, Alan was a member of something called the ARPA research community. And he was also responsible for inventing things like the modern GUI that we all use and object-oriented programming. Now, admittedly, I love talking about this, uh, especially Alan's like powerful ideas in inventing the modern GUI. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have enough time right now. So I put together some of his papers in a REPL. So if you want to learn more about this or any of the other subjects in the talk, you can go to replit slash govindit slash replicon. And of course, we can talk more about it in the Q&A. OK, now when Alan envisioned the Dynabook, this is what computers looked like. They weighed hundreds of pounds, and they took up entire rooms. Huge bonus points, by the way, if anyone in the chat knows what the system is. And if you'd like to find out, you know where to go. You can go to the REPL. Uh, Enigma is a very good guess, but that's not quite it. And uh, you'll be amazed. It's not ENIAC either. And you'll be amazed as at what that system could do only a few decades after the Enigma machine. Now, Alan imagined the Dynabook and programming and the GUI all coming together in this short story that he wrote in 1972. Now, of course, you can find the whole thing in the REPL, but I'll tell you it really quickly. 
So this is Alan's romantic dream of the future in which there are two students, Jimmy and Beth, and they're at school, but instead of being tied to a desk, they're outside in the grass. They both have their Dyna books, they're playing Space War, as you can see, but they're getting kind of bored and they want to add the effect of gravity on their spaceship, so they need to learn some physics. So they go to their teacher and their teacher helps them look up what they need already on their Dyna books and off they go. They're learning, they're building, they're creating all at the same time. Now this to me sounds pretty great. I would have loved to have done this. I would still like to do this. But this looks a lot more like the classroom that I went to. And this was despite the fact that I'm guessing all of us here have our own computing devices. And some of us even might have these iPad Pros that look a lot like the kind of book. And of course, we all have access to Replit. So, you know, it's been 50 years since Alan's vision, but we don't seem to have a lot of it. So what happened? And going back to our mission, if we imagine the next billion software creators on Replit, what do we want their experience to be? Now, if you, like me, are inspired by Alan's vision for Jimmy and Beth, what parts of it do we want to bring into the future? So I want to talk about three powerful ideas from Alan's vision for the Dyna book. His vision is more than just a story. I think it's huge and humane and inspiring. Uh, you can read more about it in the REPL, but for today, here are three powerful ideas that really inspire me. The first is that the computer is a meta medium where learning and creating can happen together. The second is that the computer allows us to have a teacher for every learner. And the third is we can do this not isolated, but networked together, learning and creating as communities. So when Alan was thinking about the Dyna book in the late 1960s, a lot of people were referring to computers as vehicles or tools. And one of the things Alan noticed was that when computers are interactive, they're not just a tool, they're an entire environment. They're a medium. And this is why in Alan's story of Jimmy and Beth, he's focusing on really young children. Because if the computer is a vehicle, if it's like a car, then you can wait until you're a teenager and you can go to driver's ed and you can learn to drive. But if it's a medium, you have to learn as soon as you can, like the way we learn write, reading and writing, ideally in early childhood. But it's not just a medium, because one of the things that a computer can, of course, do is simulate. And one of the ways we tell a computer how to simulate is with programming. Now, if you're a Repler, you obviously know this. And you know that we can simulate every other medium. We can read, we can write, uh, we can communicate, we can watch. And of course, right now we're doing all of them at the same time. But we can also simulate multiple media at the same time and can have totally new media. So that means we can make new tools for new ways of seeing and understanding. This is Ken Perlin's Chalk Talk that you're seeing in the upper left-hand corner. And I think this is awesome. You get visualization, you get symbolic representation, you get physical manipulation, you get it all at the same time. I would have loved to have learned math like this. And we can also make new games that we were never able to make before. Here's a classic. We can make uh, new kinds of art. And hopefully soon, we can do these with our entire bodies, not just you know behind a screen. And so what's special here is that, of course, everything is dynamic and it's interactive, and it's in ways that were totally, that were totally impossible before the computer. And so you know, here's a question channeling the great JCR Licklider. If it, how can AI serve Replers in learning, building, and creating all at the same time as no humans have before. So I see the chat is popping up. Tell us, like, what would you like to see on Replit? Let's hear crazy ideas. Let's also hear what you wouldn't want to see. An AI REPL? Okay, stay tuned. You're going to see the beginning of it. Support for tab nine, that's definitely something that we're thinking about. AI generated code, something like Copilot, we're definitely thinking about these things too. Okay, great. Hand motions for using phone equals code. Now, that would be very cool. Okay, so that was powerful idea number one. 
Now let's go on to powerful idea number two, a teacher for every learner. So paraphrasing Jerome Bruner, we think any repler with any background can learn any subject in an intellectually honest form. And we know this is possible in theory because it's already been done. Jerome Bruner on the left, Seymour Papert on the right, taught subjects that were typically saved for college or even grad students, like anthropology and differential geometry. And they did it in ways that were true and intellectually honest to learners that, as you can see, are probably younger than any of us here. And the way that they did this was by personalizing to the learners, based on what the learners already knew and found to be interesting. So if we take this seriously, then one question for us is how could AI help personalize tutorials to what each repler already knows? So here are two challenging, I think challenging, textbooks that I would really like to master and to have people to learn with. So tell us in the chat, what would you like to learn on Repli? And have you been able to find collaborators to learn with you? Python, of course, all your friends hate programming. Repler Zoom. TensorFlow, Swift, definitely. Package managing, Rep will do that for you. Okay, and now last but not least, uh, powerful idea number three. So the ARPA research community and a lot of our modern computing environment is due in large part to this person, JCR Licklider, and his saying, it is the destiny of computers to become interactive, intellectual amplifiers for all people pervasively networked worldwide. And so interactive means that we communicate and we collaborate both with our computers and network means that the computer helps us collaborate and communicate with each other. And communicating doesn't mean that we like send each other signals, but that we build up the same picture of the world together. And this already happens on Redlet. We communicate with the computer through the, through, uh, the GUI, and programming and the IDE. And of course, we collaborate with each other through Discord and community and multiplayer. But why not bring these two things together? So let's bring the computer more fully into the collaboration, both with ourselves and each other. So here's a question. What AI agents could help us think and create, support us and encourage us, both by ourselves and with each other? So you know, tell us in the chat, you know, on a scale of like rubber duck debugger to expert pair programmer, what sorts of AI aids or agents do you think would help you? A lot of love for the rubber duck. A simple syntax fixer. That'd be great. A Socratic companion to help think. That's awesome. Okay, so those were three powerful ideas that we want to bring even more to Repli. That the computer is a meta medium, which means we can simulate every other medium, but also link them together and build new media that are interactive and dynamic. That we can aspire towards having a teacher for every learner, and we can do this together. For the rest of this talk, I want to give you a peek into our plans to bring teachers for every learners. And I say teachers, plural, because as much as I would love to have my own AI Bruner or Papert to teach me, I think it's going to be a while before we can get there. So instead, what we're imagining is a range of AI tools and aids and helpers. So I want to show you three things. I want to show you explain, which you might have seen if you're a hacker, reimagined. I want to show you a demo of a feature coming soon for AI-assisted debugging. And I want to show you a mock-up of something that I'm really excited about, which is recommending tutorials in the IDE when they're actually needed. So if you're on the hacker plan, you've already seen Explain Code. And here's a futuristic version adapted to Space War and imagined by our very own Tyler Anger, in which a repler can choose an explanation based on the level of the complexity that they're already comfortable with. So you can see what's happening here. 
is that the Repler can choose that their explanation level is at intermediate, and then they get an explanation automatically generated for the lines of code they're, they're not quite sure about. Okay, now I wanna show you a demo for something that we're planning on shipping soon. So this is an AI feature that we built on top of Codex, which as many of you might know, is OpenAI's big deep learning system. And they, that system's called GPT-3, and they've adapted it to code, and that system's called Codex. And so this system, what we built is going to allow you to take some code and using some machine learning, return the likelihood that on each line, there might be an error. So if you're at the keynote, you've already seen a quick demo of this. And this will help you find an error if you ran some code and the interpreter comes back and it says, okay, there's an error on line 14, but you know that it could be anywhere from line zero to 14. And it will also help you if you wrote a block of code and you wanna get it checked out before you send it off to get run. Um, the way that this works at a really high level, and we can talk about this in more detail in the Q&A, is that it uses the patterns that Codex encodes while basically going through all of the code on GitHub. And what it looks out for are patterns that don't really look like the patterns that it's seen before. And when it sees a pattern that's really different from a pattern it's seen before, it flags this. And then we translate that into a probability that there's an error. So again, that was pretty high level. I'm happy to say more in the Q&A. Great. Sorry, Govind, I had to jump out for a second. Are you opening it up to questions? Not quite yet. I want, I want to show the demo really quick, and then, um, then we'll have um, lots of questions. OK. This is good old binary search. Um, and we can highlight this and check to see if there isn't any errors. Nope, let's close the demo, there are errors. And let's go ahead and fix this back up. That looks good. Great, I was close. I should have prayed more to the demo gods. Okay, so we can take, as you just saw, a code block, send it off, check for errors, and see if there are any. So this code block had no errors, and um, now let's go ahead and add some. So um, one thing that a, a linter will pick up pretty well are syntax errors. And so we can go ahead and we can add some. So let's remove this parens. Let's turn this double equals into a single equals. And let's turn this to an elif without a condition. Okay. Now we can highlight it and ask it to look for errors. And three out of three. So you can see that it's highlighting in really dark red because it thinks that errors are really likely on these lines. And if we mouse over, you can also see the probability that it thinks that there's an inaccuracy. And, um, you know, these kinds of syntax errors are things that linters typically pick up on, um, but not always. So let's go ahead and let's add up. That was helpful, thank you. And now let's add some um, downstream runtime errors. So these are things that a linter probably wouldn't pick up, and they might even not always cause an error. So for example, instead of returning mid, let's return this array position, 
Now, of course, if mid is greater than the length of the array, this is going to cause uh, an out-of-range error. Um, we can also cause a type error. Let's swap low an array here. Low is, of course, an int. And then let's remove this return. So if the function is called and high is less than low, then we'll come to this condition and we'll return none. And we can look for errors. OK, great. Um, this seems fine. I'm not sure what's wrong here. But there's an, yeah, this needs hacker plan. So this kind of exposes that the system is not yet quite perfect. But it does catch things that um, the linter wouldn't catch. Let's go back. Oh, oh actually, yeah. Oh, this is wrong. Smarter than me. OK. Um, OK, let's fix some mistakes. And now let's add some programming logic errors. So yes, AI was right after all. <laughs> um, so this is a real stretch for, um, for Codex because and it kind of exposes um, where the frontier really is for our system. So we can change the conditional. Um, we can remove the floor divide. And um, let's do one more thing. Let's swap this back. And we can select it. And we can move forward. OK, so here you can see that it thinks that there might be some mistakes here. Um, the chance of inaccuracy is a little bit lower. It's not as confident, but it does think that there's something fishy about this code. And of course, as we saw already, it picks up the error here. Uh, that's a great question. It can't yet offer solutions, but that takes us to the next thing that I'd like to talk about. So let's go back to the slides. And the last thing that I want to talk about is something that I'm really excited is on our roadmap, which is bringing tutorials into the IDE. So we want the demo that I just showed you, highlighting code and checking for bugs, to be a primitive. So what if you, it should be extensible. What if you hit a bug and you're not really sure how to debug? What do you do? Well, we should be able to serve you tutorials so that you can choose the one that's best for you. Excuse me, for those of you who said in the chat that you wanted an AI helper or a suggester, you should be able to bring one into the IDE when you want it. And when that sees that, you know, AI agent sees that it can help you, it should do so. So here's what that might look like. Here's someone who's uh, trying to build um, a Discord chatbot. And you can see that Markbot is trying to be helpful in suggesting that maybe they might need some help setting it up. So Markbot recommends some tutorials. It thinks it might help this Repler based on their background, and also some other Replers that are online and could jump into multiplayer if this Repler still needs help. I personally think this would be awesome. Replers make great tutorials. When I built the proof of concept for the demo I just showed you, I learned Flask from a tutorial made by a Repler. Shouts out to Sushi Python. And I would also love to have recommended to me when I'm staring at a blank screen in an IDE, how to get started. And of course, replers are super helpful. I mean, if you're here, you know that already. And so I'm happy to talk about how this might be possible technically in the Q&A, um, if that's something that people are interested in. OK, so thanks so much for spending some of your Saturday with me and for all of the great questions and comments in the chat. Um, if you're interested in doing this with us, if you know someone that would like to join us, if you have thoughts on what you'd like to see, please send me an email. I'm Govin at Replit. And of course, if you're excited by some of the powerful ideas and you'd like to learn more, you can go to the REPL in Replit slash at Govindit slash REPLCon. Okay. So now I'd like to open it up to Q&A. Anyone who's got um, a question that they'd like to ask, 
uh, anything they'd like to dive in deeper, I'd be happy to. All right, Govind, we have a question from Sarah Vaman. Is the market plugin available only in Replit or is it published publicly? Um, Sarah Vaman asks, is the Markbot plugin available only in Replit or will be published publicly? That's a great idea, or a great question. Um, to be honest, I haven't thought that far into the future. Um, the plugin is something that we'd like to, of course, make available on Replit and our hope is that we'll be able to expose the primitives so that they'll be extensible uh, and composable by the community. So um, if you're wanting to hack on Markbot when it exists, uh, I think we'd really like to be able to do that. Nice. Um, let's see, we also have a question. Uh, Any plans to make the AI error checking free once it's more stable? Um, that is also a great question. Um, Long term, looking down the line, this is something that we definitely want to make available to all replers. Um, right now, uh, these sorts of features are actually kind of expensive for every run, and we're actively looking for ways that we can bring the cost down so that we can make it available. Um, um, Daniel in Q and A is asking any off web file manipulation methods, SSH, um, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, Daniel, could you say more about what you're interested in um, in the chat? Oh, I see Ferris is also here uh, in the chat. Um, big thanks to Ferris for helping get um, the demo that I just showed you up and running. Um, there's no way I could have done it without Ferris. Nice. Um, let's see. Q and A. Is there a Chrome extension for AI coding? Uh, that would be awesome. Um, I would uh, love to see um, the primitives that we build be extensible in that way. Is there a book? Brandon Wilson asks, um, similar to writing prompt generators, is there a possibility for coding project idea generators? Um, absolutely. Um, we are. Uh, one of the questions that really that gets asked on Replit that I think is so exciting is what should I work on next? And um, we're looking for ways both to help users find Replit's fine projects that they'd be interested in working on. And we're also looking for, looking for ways to be able to help someone go from a really high level idea to maybe a flow chart for the control flow and, and to pseudocode and then actual function definitions and to have AI kind of make that each step of that process easier. Um, Dylan Shades asks, are there any thoughts about teaching more conceptual things with Replit, such as just rather than just practical things such as algorithms and data structures? Absolutely. Um, what we'd like to, what I personally would like to be able to see is something where, you know, I put up a picture of um, uh, sick peak, um, and I would love a system that would be able to not just help me learn that kind of challenging programming material, but also recommend how the code that I'm writing could be rewritten uh, in order to help me master that material. So for example, let's say I'm building a game on Kaboom, and there's an opportunity to use concurrency or a streaming data structure. Um, we would want to be able to allow someone to highlight some of their code and ask, is there a way that I could write this so that I could learn a new powerful concept? Could I go more in depth on how the error detecting AI works? Absolutely. Um, so the way you can think about the stack is that first, um, Code is highlighted. Um, that's right. It, oh, it's okay. Code is highlighted. It's sent to um, OpenAI's Codex. Codex returns some probabilities, and then we transform those probabilities into the likelihood that there's an error on each line. So let me explain that in a little bit more detail. Um, what happens is that 
Codex is what uses what's called unidirectional loss. And so that means that it takes a sequence of characters, and then for that sequence, it tries to guess what's the most likely character that comes next. That's code generation. Now, in this context, we give it a sequence of characters, and then we show it the next character that was written in the code snippet that was sent. And then we ask, what's the probability of this token? And Codex will, when, usually when there is a syntax error, it's you know, really quite good at this. And so it says the probability here is quite low. And then it also shows us five characters, the top five characters that it expected to see. And so when the probability of a token is really low and the probability of the top replacement token is really, really high, we're more confident that there's an error here. So for those of you who have some familiarity with machine learning, what we do is we take the probability of the token and the probability of the five replacement tokens. We do some feature engineering, and then we put that into something called logistic regression, and that predicts the likelihood that there's an error. Um, to do this, I had to build some training data, of course. I'm happy to talk about that if that's of interest. Just a heads up, everyone, we are a couple minutes over time. Um, I want to make sure you all don't miss your next session. But Govind, if people have more questions, how can they? Oh, wait, it's on your slide. They can reach you. Email me. Awesome. Email him. Um, he is doing great work. So you'll also probably hear more about his work through the Replit official Twitter. But thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. And Govind, any last words before we close it up? Thank you uh, so, so much for being here with us. Um, I, this is really so exciting to me. And if you're excited about this too, if you know someone else who's excited about this and you'd like to come build out this vision with us, please email me. I'm Govind at Replit. Thank you. All right, everyone. We'll see you in the next session. Bye.